If you are a part of the Christ Church family, uh, I want to add my welcome with Kirks. We are so glad that you are with us this morning and uh, got up early on a Sunday morning, made it out, and uh, have joined hearts together uh, in worship of who the Lord is, and uh, so grateful for that. If you are a guest with us today, I also would like to say thank you. I don't know what brought you in this morning. I don't know who invited you. I don't know what need in your life spurred you. I don't know what you're searching for, but I hope for the next little while, you will give your heart and attention to what God says because you will discover in Christ the true satisfaction for your soul. And I hope that we can make him clear to you this morning. I am coming this morning, uh, having come off of a very fun 2022. 2022 had two major events in my life. First of all, most of you in this room will not relate to this at all, at all. I became a grandfather. And uh, my little granddaughter, Adeline Jeline, was born on October the 10th. And uh, if you look closely at her little finger, I am wrapped all around that little finger. I was on the phone with my daughter this past week on FaceTime, and uh, she had set the phone so that it was looking down at where Adeline was, and Adeline was looking up, and, and, and just being the old guy that I am, I, I thought, because I could see her, she saw me, and I'm at one point conducting a actually rather serious conversation with my daughter, while at the same time making faces to my granddaughter to get her to smile, and after about 10 minutes, finally my daughter stopped me and said, Dad... She can't see you, only I can see you, and it's hard for me to have this conversation <laughs> with you making those faces, would you stop it? And so I did. So that was on October 10th, that's a big deal. Then on December 30th, I had another huge event in my life, and after about a year and uh, two, three months, a year and four months of dating, I was able to marry Kimberly. So we are about one month into our marriage. So I'm just saying, if any of you have counsel for us, we'll be here open to your instruction. We're newlyweds, and so uh, looking forward to any advice you might give. Well, uh, I am looking forward to our study this morning. Would ask that you would uh, take your Bibles. We're in a series called otherworldly, in but not of. This is what Jesus calls us to in the book of John. I, I came across, somebody sent me these photos this week. Uh, somebody had a file cabinet that apparently they did not like, and they did not want anybody to know there was a file cabinet in the corner. So they decided to paint it to blend into the corner, and so they did. You'll, you'll notice that they painted that file cabinet so that you can no longer see it. Got to kind of open the door to even know that it's there. And I, I saw that, and I thought, that's what the culture is trying to do to me. The culture is trying to say, stop standing out, and instead, blend in. Lose your distinction for Jesus and gain your distinction for this culture. And I'm so grateful that God's word helps us to understand that Jesus has called us to be light in darkness. He has called us to be salt as a contrast. And he has called us to be hope in hopelessness. Let's not give up the role that Jesus has given to us. So, Let's examine this theme this morning. What is it that makes us stand out? What makes us distinct? What makes us otherworldly? Is otherworldly just being weird and eccentric? Well, we might be weird and eccentric, but that's not Jesus' work in our life. Is otherworldly being abrasive and combative? I think we're going to discover, no, that's, that's not what makes us stand out. We are being shaped by something other than this culture. And here's the truth that shapes our otherworldliness. This is the big idea for our message this morning, and it is this. Every aspect of otherworldly living is directly linked to the Word of God. Every, every part of that which makes us otherworldly, it is otherworldly because of the influence of the word of God in our lives. So would you turn with me to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8. If you are new to the Bible, 
First of all, if you don't have a Bible, there's one in the chair, I think, right in front of you. And you can grab that and use that this morning and uh, would welcome that. Or you can uh, look on with a friend or on your phone, Deuteronomy chapter 8. We're going to read verses 1 through 3. As we look at this, just put yourself in what's happening here. The nation of Israel is on the east bank of the Jordan River. They are now listening to Moses give to them three messages. Deuteronomy is basically three recorded messages given over the course of a month. We're we're, we're parachuting into the middle of one of those messages. Moses says, The whole commandment that I command you today, you shall be careful to do that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land that the Lord swore to give to your fathers. And you shall remember the whole way that the the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what is in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. The big idea is that every aspect of our worldly living is directly linked to the word of God. And we're going to look at three links given to us from this passage this morning. And here is the first link. It is this. God is always blessing my life by the word. God is always blessing my life by the word. Now, let's look at this here in verse one. Remember that there is a so that that is given there. He says that you may live and multiply and go in and, and you may possess the land that the Lord swore to give to your fathers. This is the blessing that Moses is sharing from God by inspiration to the nation of Israel. But let's go back and see what sets up that blessing. He says, here's what happens. The whole commandment that I have given to you, not not part of it, but the whole commandment that I have given to you, you must be careful to do. We, We can be careful about a lot of things in our life. We can be careful about our appearance. I am grateful that Um, my wife is actually helping me with my appearance. That's a good thing. After having been single since my late wife passed, I've been single for a while, I needed help. And she's trying to help me this morning. And I push back. And so she pushes my boundaries a little bit. And I'm, I'm thankful for that. Some of you, you're really careful about your appearance. Some of you are very careful about your presence on social media. I mean, it's thought out and it's tuned. And I mean, you you are very careful about what you're putting out there on social media. Some of you are very careful about your finances. Others of you are like, I don't know, if there's something in my wallet or, or my card isn't rejected, I'm good to go. But some of you actually track your income and your spending and you actually are really careful about that. Kudos to you if you are. Some of you are very careful about your academics. Others of you are like, what? Some of you are careful about your career, your business, your responsibilities, your job, the mission that your boss has given to you. The question that Moses is presenting to followers of God this morning is this, be careful about something that is transcendent. And what is that transcendent carefulness that we should have? And it is this, it is to do the whole commandment. It is to do everything that God has called us to do. You see, we need to understand something that God has provided for us from the goodness of his character, a plan and a will for us. That in Romans chapter 12 and verse two, it says this, that you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. God's will for us is good, it is pleasing, and it is perfect. Yet there is a message that is perpetuated by the lie of Satan, cultivated by our society, and desired by my fallen flesh, and it is this lie 
that God's will for me will limit me, will prohibit me from having fun. It will prohibit me from enjoying life. It will keep me from having the good life. This week, I was in a counseling situation talking with a guy who was just absolutely miserable in his, in his life and marriage. And he's just like, I don't know why I'm so miserable. And as we were talking about this, we began to unpack a little bit and we came back to this. He just basically said, I'm just not convinced that what God has for me is truly good for me. And I was grateful. <laughs> this guy was willing to be honest. And this guy was willing to say the, the real thing that was going on in his heart. I'm just not sure that God is good. The culture would love to jump on that and say, oh yeah, try and unpack. And they, they can go, they can find some Yahoo Christian out there that's gonna represent some fringe of Christianity and they're gonna point to that as normal instead of a faithful follower of Jesus Christ. Listen, I want you to understand this. God loved us so much and he wanted us to have good so much. Even when we were broken, not merely broken, but we were broken and running from God. Not even broken and running from God, we were broken and running from God, but we were actually pushing back against God in our life. In the midst of our brokenness, God in his love and his goodness sent his very son into this world to go to the cross. And there on the cross, he took upon himself the brokenness of my sin and my rebellion and your sin and your rebellion. And he died for it so that he could give to us that which is God's very best. And if he who would not withhold his own son, how will he not also give to us all good things? You see, we have to understand that the blessing that God has for us is the very best for us. The problem is often we haven't tasted it. We haven't experienced it. We've never truly enjoyed it. It's like growing up, my kids, I have two kids, a daughter, Victoria, my son, Isaac, and they're, they're both in their mid-20s and married, but there was a time they loved hot dogs. They thought hot dogs were amazing. And I loved that time because it was easy. I could surprise them and I could please them. I bought you hot dogs. I'm like, Dad, you're amazing. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, it was 99 cents. Yeah, I'm amazing. And then somebody somewhere ruined my whole life. And they introduced to my son steak. And he's never been satisfied with hot dogs since. And we spend a lot of our life living for hot dogs that this world can give us, and it's not even that. And we're missing out on the goodness that God has willed for us and provided for us through the death and resurrection of his son. And there is only one way that we can possibly know this goodwill, and it is truly found, as Moses says, this whole commandment that I command you today, you shall be careful to do so that you can live and you can go in and you can experience the blessing that he has promised and that he has provided. So this morning, I urge you, as followers of Christ, we need to yearn for the blessing that God has. Blessing is not like the frosting. Blessing is central in its core and it's essential to the follower of Jesus Christ. We need to be people who yearn for, who hunger for, who desire, who pray for. We, are, we need to be a people who are, I would say, are desperate for the blessing of God. Because the blessing of God is not something extra and special. It is God's will for us. And so we need to pursue it. But the only way we're going to know the blessing of God is through his word. And again, we saw that there in Romans 12. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way that you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. So our life is otherworldly because God's word has planted into us an appetite that can only be satisfied by God's blessing. But there's a second link of the otherworldly life 
to God's word, and that is this. God is always testing my heart toward the word. God is always testing my heart toward the word. Now, let's go back and let's just remind ourselves of the historical context for a moment. Remember, this is the second time that Israel has found itself at this location. This is the second time they've been on the east side of the Jordan River, looking finally with physical eyes to see the land where their forefathers lived, the land that God had promised to Abraham, their great-great-great-grandfather, the, 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 the father of faith, the land that he led them, led Abraham and his, and his family to. They can see it across the Jordan and they sent spies in to check it out and to see all of its goodness. And the spies came back and 10 of them said, this is an, an absolutely overwhelmingly glorious land, but there's a problem. There's these giants in the land and there's no way we can possibly overcome the giants. And there are two that were there who said, wait, no, hold on a minute. God who created the universe and these people is the God who promised the land to us. We can trust him. We can depend upon him. We can be confident in him. Let's go into the land. Let's trust God. Let's prove our trust in God by obeying him. Let's do it. And Israel said, no. And God said, okay then you will never see the land. You will never experience this blessing because the blessing of God is only experienced through faith in God. Trust, faith, dependence on God as revealed in his word is the only exclusive pathway to God's blessing. There's not a shortcut. There's not a plan B. That's it. And God said, oh, you're not gonna trust me? You're gonna, not going to take me at my word, okay? Th then there's no reason why you should live in the good land that I've promised you. So 40 years, they literally just wandered in circles in the desert, waiting for the faithless generation to die so that the a second generation would have the opportunity to prove their faith to God. You get it? And that's what's happening right now. That's exactly what's happening right now. They are there for the second time. Moses is coming to them and he's saying, listen, he says to them in verse two, and you shall remember that the whole way the Lord has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, there's a purpose to the wandering. There was a purpose. And what is it? It is that he might humble you, testing you to know what is in your heart. Can I just pause and just give a word of encouragement? You might be in the middle of a test right now. I don't mean like an academic test. You might be that too, but I'm, I'm talking a life test where you're being pressured whether or not you're going to depend upon what God said and take him at his word or if you're gonna follow a plan B. You're in a, you're in a faith test right now. Or you might be in the middle of a pressure in your life. Like, I mean, the heat in your life is ramped up. Maybe you have a physical situation that's scaring you. Or you've got a family member that right now is going through a, a physical situation and, and you just are, you're, it's heavy on your heart. Or maybe there is a difficulty that's going on in your life. I, I don't know. I just know that that's what I deal with all day, every day, all week long. There are people around us who are carrying heavy burdens. And I want you to understand something. God has not forgotten. And God is not being cruel to you. But God understands that the most important thing about you is your faith. And he wants your faith to be pure. And he wants your faith to be robust. He wants your faith, as James chapter one says, to be able to be a faith that endures. So he tests it. He allows testing to happen to reveal what is in our heart. So this first generation, instead of being confident in God's promises and going forward, they became overwhelmed, what seemed like insurmountable obstacles, and they operated in the flesh rather than operating by faith, and they operated by trusting what they could see rather than trusting what God had said. And so now God is testing them, and they are at a point where God is going to reveal 
their heart. That's what he says. So that he would, so that you would know what is in your heart. There's an important truth here as well. God already knows what's in our heart. God's not in heaven going, I wonder what their faith is like. God's not in heaven going, I wonder what their heart is like. God already knows. The key is we need to know our heart. God is using these circumstances to reveal to them their heart. And what's the big deal out of, about the heart? Well, Proverbs chapter four and verse 23 tells us that keep your heart with all vigilance for from it flow the springs of life. In other words, every aspect of my life all flows backwards to a situation of the heart. My heart is the fountainhead for every aspect of my life. My heart and its attitude towards God is the most important thing about me. Not what's outside of me, but what's inside of me. In fact, I think it's valuable to say that our relationships are defined by our heart attitude toward another person. I'm a newlywed. I'm going to be kind of vulnerable with you this morning. Kimberly doesn't know about this, so she's probably kind of nervous right now. This past week, there was a moment when there was a thing, because we're kind of like learning the new things about each other, you know, the, the right way to do it, because that's the way I've always done it. And the other person's like, well, I've done this. I mean, she's a lot younger than me, but we both have some years in order to, to, to do life together. And, and now all of a sudden we're bringing those two ways of doing things into the same household. You just wait, you're going to try this out for yourselves. It's fun. It's a lot of fun. We've been going through it. It's actually been going well. And then all of a sudden, there was just this moment this past week, one evening, when all of a sudden, poof, I just came unglued. Like, I'm not proud of it. I'm not happy about it. I'm deeply embarrassed by it. But I thought I'd be honest with you. I spoke to her with unkind words. Now, the world would tell me, Tori, it's because you had had a hard day. And I actually had had a hard day, but that's not the issue. Well, Tori, it's, it's a difficult time. You're going through a lot of transitions in your life. And yeah, there's a lot of adjustments that I'm going through, but no, that's not it. The fact of the matter is the little thing that Kimberly and I faced together on that evening this week poked uniquely at my heart and my heart revealed itself. And it revealed itself to be selfish. And it revealed itself that I was willing to say unkind things to somebody that I declared my love to. Now, she's standing there looking at me like, what in the world just happened and who are you? Did it affect our relationship? It did. And I had to respond to that. And there's only one way to deal with sin. There's not two ways to deal with sin. There's one way to deal with sin, confession and repentance. And so I had to confess it to her. And I had to repent. And I had to confess it to God. And I had to repent because my problem was not a circumstance problem. My problem was a heart problem. The circumstances merely revealed the heart that I didn't even know was there. I was as shocked as she was. And there's an issue in our lives. We all have hearts that are being shaped and formed into the image of Christ, if you know him as your savior. And as he shapes and forms us into the image of Christ, he is going to reveal to us our heart. And we're gonna be like, that's in there? Yep, that's in there. And he doesn't reveal it to us so that he can mock us. He reveals it to us so that he can rescue us. That hard moment this week with Kimberly was not so that he could drive me into the dust but so that he could show me there's an aspect of my heart that can know the rescuing grace of Jesus Christ because Jesus already paid for it. I'm already forgiven. I already know that there's the power of grace for my life in that moment. He's not called me to live with guilt. He's not called me to live with regret. He's called me to run to Christ and there to know his grace. And here we find Moses telling them, listen, here's what's going on. I I'm telling you, God let you wander in the, in the wilderness so that you would know your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. What was the central thing about the heart? 
What was the central issue of the heart? The central issue of the heart had to do with the word of God. And what is their attitude? What is their relationship to the word of God? Listen, this is an issue of faith. He's revealing their heart to them so that he would know their faith, not what they pro- profess, but what they demonstrate. Listen, can I just share a few things that might help you? You might be sitting here going, I, I really do want to love Jesus. I really do want to follow Jesus. I'm kind of new to the faith and I'm trying to understand this. And yeah, what you talk about, Tori, I do see things in my heart. And when, when he shows those things to me, what do I do? And what I'm telling you is, is that you run to the word of God, all right? And, and, and here's some tests that you can have that will help you understand your faith. Here's some questions. Just think about it. Does your faith cause you to evaluate your circumstances based on the character of God? Or does your faith cause you to evaluate your God in light of your circumstances? You see the difference? In your life right now, as you face circumstances, what is your faith response to those circumstances? Are you in those circumstances running to and clinging to the word of God and everything that God has said about himself? And you're saying, well, I don't know much what's going on in life, but I do know this. God has spoken. I can trust him. I'm going to depend upon his word. So I'm going to evaluate my circumstances based on how God's word reveals God to be. That's a robust maturing faith. Or are you stepping back and you're evaluating God in light of your circumstances? Look out, that goes nowhere good. And it goes nowhere good really fast. Here's another question. Is your faith formed by all that God says in his word? Or are you custom crafting your faith to be what you are comfortable with? In other words, do you approach God's word and you just open up and say, speak to me, Lord. Holy Spirit of God, help me to understand your word so that I can know who you are, so I can follow you as you've called me to follow you, and you are just open to the authority of the whole of God's inspired, sufficient, inerrant word? Or are you taking the word of God and you're looking at it going, well, there's a dimension here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let that part be God's word to me, but not that other part. If you're dissecting God's word and you're choosing to follow parts, but not others, you need to be careful. Your faith is in a dangerous place. Uh, one more question, and I'll, I'll move on. Is your faith easy and comfortable or does your faith challenge and transform you? Is your faith something that hasn't really impacted your life recently, like purifying your love for God, like challenge you to trust God more? Has has your faith pushed you and grown you or is it one that's comfortable and it's really not ever pressed in on your life at all? If it hasn't pressed in on your life, You might want to go back and evaluate what is it that you're truly trusting? What is the object of your faith that you're placing your confidence in? I'm very concerned as I talk with people, there is an age of skepticism that says, I'm going to live skeptical of God. I'm, I'm I'm going to question God And I want you to know, there's nothing wrong with examining your faith deeply. Paul talks about that in the book of Acts where the Thessalonians were very noble because they searched the scriptures daily to see if these things are so. But I want you to think, while God wants us to have a faith that is deeply rooted and discerning between what God has said and what man has said, and that's the point of what Acts is telling us there in chapter 17, is, is that man's word or God's word The attitude behind it is an attitude that is honoring to the Lord. For instance, here's a question. Do you ask questions of God or do you question God as God? Do you ask questions of God? God, Holy Spirit, would you help me understand this part? It's difficult for me to wrap my head around and I need to understand this because I trust you to be a God that is faithful, that desires the very best for me. And yet, Lord, I'm struggling. Would you help me understand who you are as you've revealed yourself in your word? That's asking questions of God. Or do you ask questions of God as God? Well, God, you need to explain yourself a little bit here. Like, 
I'm not totally sure I'm happy with you. I'm not completely sure I agree with you. I'm not completely sure that that aligns with my way of thinking. And God in heaven goes, goodness, gracious, let me start all over again. Tori is struggling with whether or not I align with him or not. Now, see, we need to be asking the question, okay, God, what is it that your word is saying so that I can know your truth as it is revealed so that it can transform me not to stand in judgment over God's word. I'm going to leave that alone. There's more that I'd like to say, but the second generation now has this opportunity to have their heart revealed by the word of God and toward the word of God. What is my response to God? And the point in all of this is this, your faith is revealed by your relationship with the word. And if your relationship with the word is not healthy, then your heart toward God is not going to be healthy. And if your relationship to the word is passionate, then your heart relationship with God is going to grow and become passionate. So we see here that our life is otherworldly because God's word has revealed and transformed our hearts. But let's move on and let's look at, there's a third link from God's word and it is this, proving my need for the word. My life is otherworldly because of this link that it is, God is constantly proving my need for the word. They had wandered around in circles in the desert. Their food ran out and they became desperately hungry. And God came to them and he said, trust me, I will provide for you. And so he created this thing called manna, which literally means, what is it? And scholars have been trying to figure out what manna was ever since. And I think I have some insight into that. You might want to take notes here. It was light. It was doughy. It tasted like honey. It was a sopapilla. <laughs> That's what it was. Sopapillas were created in heaven. That's what it is. So that's a really cool thing to understand that actually sopapillas have the root back in Jewish history. And, uh, and I'm not sure I totally connected all the dots accurately. Go talk with Pastor Nick about that later. But God gave to them manna. And manna was unique. It came from heaven. Not anything they worked for, not anything they deserved. It just came from heaven. They went out, they could eat it, but they could only eat what they could have for that day. And once the next day came, if there was any manna left over or collected, it would rot. It was no longer good. And, and the point that God was telling them was this, live in dependence upon me for all of your needs. Earthly provisions will ultimately run out and will disappoint because your life is about more than just your physical life. The most important thing about you is your faith. It is your spiritual life. So God came to them and he said, I'm gonna give to you manna, but the purpose of this manna is to turn your heart toward me. See what it says there in verse three, and he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Jesus quoted this when he was undergoing testing and trial and temptation by Satan. Satan was coming to him and he was saying, the most important thing about you are your physical needs. You have experienced physical want. You are in a grave place, Jesus. You are facing a real problem. It's a physical problem. And I'm going to come to you and I'm going to offer to you a physical solution. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. And he quotes this verse and he says, no, man will not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And Jesus was making the point that was saying, I have a greater need than any physical need. It is a spiritual need. And I need provision that will meet my spiritual needs more than I need to have my physical needs met. God allowed them to go through difficulty, to teach them a life-giving truth, you can't truly live without God's word. God's word is truly life-giving. And, 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 and it's not just some of God's word again, but it is by every word that God has given. And our problem is we feel and we see 
And we're physical beings and we experience physical needs. And so those physical needs seem to be more real to us. They seem to be more important to us. And so we prioritize them and we place our hopes and dreams and expectations in them. And yet we need to hear the warning from Jeremiah chapter 2 where Jeremiah says this, has any nation ever traded its gods for new ones, even though they're not gods at all? Yet my people have exchanged their glorious God for worthless idols. The heavens are shocked at such a thing and shrink back in horror and dismay, says the Lord, for my people have done two evil things. What are they? Number one, they have abandoned me, the fountain of living water. And secondly, they have dug for themselves cracked cisterns that can hold no water at all. We spend our lives trying to fill up cracked cisterns that constantly are depleted and disappoint while we neglect the word of God sometimes and the truly life-giving word that we need. Earthly resources are not wrong. Paul tells us in 1 Timothy 6, teach those who are rich in this world not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which is so unreliable. Their trust should be in God, which richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. I love that. He provides our needs and he even wants us to enjoy the provision that he gives for our needs. It all has to do with our heart, our heart expectation, our heart confidence. If your heart is trusting in and expect this world's resources to give you true life, then your heart needs transformation. But if your heart is grateful to God for his provision of earthly resources while you hunger and yearn desperately for the true provisions that God has given to you through his word to meet your true need, which is a spiritual faith need, to to see his word as gracious, as authoritative, as sufficient, as loving, as life-giving, if you do, then that's spiritual maturity. Because we don't just need manna, physical provision. We desperately need the life-giving word of, of God. And so, as we enjoy God's provisions in our life, do we use God's provisions to be a pointer back to our real need, which is his word? Because it is through his word that we know him. And as we know him, we can trust him. And as we trust him, we grow up in him. And as we grow up in him, we are able to experience the blessing that God has designed for us. See, the big idea that we had as we started off this message is this. Every aspect of otherworldly living is directly linked to the word of God. So what do we do with this? What do we do with this? Well, as you know, here at Christ Church, We have learning to live. Now, I want us to think about three important ways of learning to live. Number one, obey the gospel. If this morning you're sitting here and you're like, I I don't even know what it means to have Jesus do a transforming work in my life. I want you to understand the way that he works. Here's how he works. He will come and he will speak to you through his word. He will show to to you your need in great love. And he will point out to you that the answer for your need is ultimately Jesus Christ. You may not understand all that that means. You may not understand all what that provision is. What you just need to know is that it is all found in the fountainhead of Jesus Christ. And when God speaks to you that way, you must respond. And how do you respond? You respond by turning from trusting everything else and you take God at his word. That's what faith is, taking God at his word. And you depend upon him. And you say, God, would you forgive me of my sin? God, would you transform my life that I can know your best so that I could live for you? The first way we respond to the transforming work of God is to obey the gospel. If you have questions about that, we would love to talk with you about that this morning. Secondly, consume the word. Put yourself in the word. Put yourself in the word by reading the word. Put yourself in the word by listening to music that is faithful to the truths of the word. Put yourself in community that is discussing the word and growing together in the word. Put yourself in worship. Well, you're already doing that, so keep it up. Continue to worship and hear the preaching of God's word. Listen to to good, faithful preaching that has been recorded like we can find at the Christ Church resources page on the app but you need to be consuming the word. That is your responsibility. 
Babies wait for others to feed them. Adults pursue feeding themselves. As you mature, own your responsibility to be feeding on the word of God. And then thirdly, engage in community. I've already talked about that. But God has not called you to live in isolation. He has called you to live in community. You will grow best when you are around other people who too are seeking to grow and they will encourage you, support you in that journey as you seek to follow him.